Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 13th, 2019. Wow. 13th already. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. There's a disclaimer screen. I could sum it up really quickly. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep your questions to the slides to prevent my ADD from kicking in. And as we get towards the end of the slides, and I'll let you know when we open it up for individual stocks, feel free to ask about anything you want. Answers requiring a lot of thought, I'll have to put together a presentation for, and I'll cover either in an upcoming week in charts or in a Q&A. And if you're not a member of daylander.com, I'll give you access for that particular show. And then, of course, ask about your favorite stock picks, but hold off again till we get the live charts for that. And also, just ask about one stock at a time, and that's for your benefit, just so I know what I covered. So what are we talking about? Well, hey, lizard brain, is this part of your anatomy controlling your trading decisions? And the answer to that is it is. Plus, where's winter? I've been focusing a lot about market conditions. So this week, instead of going through a bunch of slides on that, I'll go through a few slides, bring up a couple little things, and then we'll hop into the charts and talk about that in detail with the live charts. Hey, Lizard Brain, is this part of your anatomy controlling your trading decisions? Now, my apologies for making the double entendre. You women often say that we men are controlled by a much smaller part of our anatomy, and so are you. And again, my apologies for making the double entendre, but I'm referring, I'm referring, I'm referring, <laughs> Medea just channeled me there for a second. I'm referring to the amygdala. Now, before we get into all that, I'm no neuroscientist, but I have stayed in a holiday in Express. And here's the thing. You don't have to be a neuroscientist or a rocket surgeon to trade, but it helps if you know a few of these concepts. And in this case, I want to talk a little bit about our physiology and how it affects us on an emotional level. So you don't have to be a brain surgeon or a neurologist to know all these things, but knowing a little will help you to understand yourself. Now, before we get into all that, what am I talking about? Well, I'm referring to your amygdala. And I like this definition that I found out there. Responsible for the perception, I like that word perception, of emotions such as anger, fear, and sadness. And what you see in the markets, I love that word perception, because what you see in the markets is not necessarily what's there. And I'm sort of channeling Mark Douglas here on a little bit of a tangent. What you see in the market is your perception of that market. And as I've often shown the bear market we had a few years back in Coco, and it's like, well, how upset were you about that bear market? And in the presentations that I gave, not one person was upset. Why? Well, because they were not a participant. So their perception of what happened really didn't matter. There were no emotions attached. Now, Getting back to the amygdala, it provides an immediate response. It's a very little, small, fast-acting part of your brain. Now, this is great for flight or fight situations. So if you're a caveman and you're faced with a saber-toothed tiger, you have two decisions to make, and you better make those really, really quick. So this is part of our physiology, and it's kind of a brilliant and beautiful design. If you embrace it, it's just pretty amazing how it all works. And it's great if you're a caveman and you have to decide whether to run away or fight. However, in many modern day situations, not so much. So we're faced with this neurology that does keep us alive, and a lot of times it stops us from getting hit by the speeding car, 
for instance, yesterday I was out on a bike ride and this guy just flat out didn't stop for the stop sign. And I heard the car coming and I immediately hit my brakes and that little amygdala reaction saved my life. In these situations, you really, really need that emotional part of your brain to take over because there's not much time to contemplate your navel. However, a lot of times when it comes to trading, especially we're held hostage to those emotions. Now, here's the thing. You can't make decisions without your amygdala, and then you can't make decisions without your emotions. Now, you guys who have been attending these presentations for a while know that this is a bit of a reoccurring theme with me with decisions and emotions. And this all stems from, oh, I forget how many years it was, it's several years now, Hank Pruden over at Golden Gate University. Hank's no longer with us, but Hank was a fantastic guy. I met him through the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. He brought me over to speak for one of their conferences that they had, and Denise Shaw spoke right before me. And I found her presentation very interesting. She talked a lot about the fact that they tell you to control your emotion or eliminate your emotions. Well, you can't control and especially eliminate. You cannot eliminate your emotions because every decision has an emotion attached. And that really stuck with me, and I've really taken the ball and ran with it from there. Because every decision has emotions, and taken one step further, it also has stress attached to it. So what does that mean? Well, we must embrace and not try to eliminate our emotions since we can't make decisions without them. So you could see if you try to eliminate your emotions in the making of a decision, then you could end up creating more and more stress for you. And it could be sort of a cyclical self-fulfilling prophecy where the stress creates more stress. But if you embrace your emotions and know you're going to be emotional, that goes a long ways. Now, the way they know that you need this part of your brain to make decisions, and this was the example I think that Denise Scholl gave, and I've seen other examples from Damasio and others in more recent times. But the examples are those people who have been unfortunate to have illness or injury damage that part of their brain can no longer make a decision because there's no longer a consequence that goes with the decision. And Denise Scholl gave the example of a doctor trying to schedule an appointment with someone who has had this unfortunate accident or illness where that part of their brain is damaged. And the reason why they should have the appointment, let's say on Tuesday, and then their reason why they should have the appointment on Wednesday, and then they'll start over again, they'll arrive at a stalemate because neither day has a consequence attached in any emotions because they no longer have that emotional part of the brain. So how do we embrace this amygdala? How do we wrap our head around that, so to speak? Well, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna recognize and acknowledge that all decisions, all decisions are emotionally based. And I keep coming back to Charles Kettering in a lot of these trading problems that I present. And Kettering once said that a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. Well, I've defined the problem. In fact, I haven't defined it. The neurologists long before me have figured out that this little emotional part of our brain is involved in the decision-making process and decisions cannot happen without emotion. So once we wrap our head around that, once we embrace that, then we can start to move on to step two and begin to embrace our emotions. So what I would recommend you do, and this is something that I do quite often, as much as possible, and sometimes even constantly, is embrace your emotions. You want to feel them. You want to get in touch with them. And you want to be cognizant from this point forward of your emotions on every decision you make in your life, and you're soon going to realize how emotional you are, even though you might not realize that you are. Now, getting back to every decision, even what you're going to have for lunch 
has an emotional consequence and it has to have an emotional consequence otherwise you couldn't make that decision now when i do these shows i get up i get up really early i get up really early every day but anyway on on thursdays i get up at 4 55 like every other day and i work on these presentations for hours and then by the time i get, give the show i put everything into it i'm usually exhausted by the end of the show and i'm also really hungry it's amazing how much these shows are speaking in general takes out of me i'm starving after i speak and there's probably a little neurology in that i don't know if i know there might be a there's a psychiatrist in here i don't know if there's a neurologist in here but your brain does consume a tremendous amount of energy i think your brain is like was about six pounds and it consumes like i forget the the amount but it's a ridiculous amount of glucose that is consumed by your brain anyway getting back to my consequence of lunch i like there's a little gas station that is not too far from here and they have like these really this really good catfish and i always crave catfish on thursdays but then when i think about going get some not to say that i won't but i go through this mental masturbation which is a little bit emotional in nature if you think about it so i begin to think about the consequence well once on your lips forever on your hips right or in my case my boobs and the other thing is the doctor has told me that i have a fluid retention problem well i knew that but basically he said lay off the sodium easier said than done especially when we live down in the south where we have a lot of good food a lot of bad for you good food anyway <laughs> I don't want to turn into one of those people of Walmart that walks around with shorts and compression socks. <laughs> this was this happened a while back. This was at our old house right before we moved. Found this huge snake in the garage, and I told Marcy, my wife, I said, "Get a picture of me. I'm going to put this on Facebook and look like a badass." And then when I went to post it, I realized that I had on shorts and compression socks. So that kind of took away from my badass nature of capturing this rather dangerous looking snake. Anyway, before I digress too far, just remember that every decision, every decision you make has an emotional consequence. And getting back to the catfish, I know that if I eat catfish this afternoon, I'm gonna be lethargic and I have to, or would like to at least get a podcast out. I have to do my analysis, which will take a couple of hour, couple hours. I need to publish my trading service and check in on facebook and there's a host of other things i need to do and if i'm sleepy it's gonna be hard to do all those things properly so again something as simple as what you're gonna have for lunch has a big consequence now obviously we need to be especially cognizant of our trading emotions and what i would encourage you to do there is journal your f-bombs and like i said a minute ago, if you're detached from a market because you're not in it, it shouldn't make any difference. What you're seeing is your perception of the market. So wrap your head around your perception of the market, especially through your F-bombs. It's funny, yesterday there was a stock. Now, I was in it a, a few weeks ago, so it wasn't completely crazy. But I remember looking at that thing yesterday, and I literally dropped an F-bomb. And I realized, wait a minute, you big dummy, you're not even in that stock. So that kind of brought me back to the being attached, detached thing, and then how emotional I really am. And another thing that you should do is journal your temptations. I'll give you a temptation yesterday. BYND, gap lower, major gap lower. Man, I was really tempted to play that opening gap reversal. Well, by putting it in writing saying, man, I'm tempted by this, and then it made me realize that, you know what, you big dummy, this is not worth it. Now, the other thing you can do is, or you should do is, then resist those temptations by holding yourself accountable. Now, I mentioned the potential trade in the Facebook group, and then I said, you know, this is just too crazy. And one of you guys said, I wouldn't touch out with a 10-foot pole. And I'm like, you know what, you're right. And... I think me sort of putting it out there was kind of like talking out loud, like, hey, look at this crazy thing. And then it enabled me to come to my senses and realize that this is probably not a good idea. Now, one way I often hold myself accountable is through 
for instance, the trading service or possibly if I do mention a stock that I'm going after in the Facebook group. So let's say that I recommend the stock and we're going to get in at 10 and we got to stop at 8 and initial profit target at 12. Well, I try to stay as true as possible to that plan. Now, occasionally there will be a little discretion. But as a general statement, I hold myself accountable and that forces me to hold myself accountable because I already laid out my trading plan and how I'm going to trade it. The other thing I often do is on stocks that I either don't recommend personally or just take it on my own, but don't recommend publicly, I should say, what I'll do is kind of one of those, what would Dave Landry do? Because I remember a few years back, for instance, I had some Forex trades on and I told my wife, I said, she's like, what's going on? And it's like, I said, oh man, I got all these trades on. And they're doing really great, but I don't know what to do. And she's like, well, what would Dave Landry do? And she turned on her heel and walked out of the office. And I was like, okay, what would Dave Landry do? Okay. Not that I'm the grand poobah, but I can't sit up here and preach day in and day out to plan your trade, trade your plan, and just do it, and then not do it. That would make me a hypocrite. What's it, Norm McDonald? I like the, I like the bit he does about uh, his friend saying that Bill Cosby was a hypocrite. And the worst thing is, he was a hypocrite. It's like, that seems like a hypocrite would be pretty far down the line. Maybe drugging and raping women would be a little bit further up the line. Possibly the worst thing. Anyway, before I digress too far, James Clear and Atomic Habits. If you haven't read it or listened to it, I would recommend you, you listen to it. He talked a lot about commitment devices. Also, if you can't sleep at night and get really bored, Go in and watch and also read the presentations that I've done on Acrasia and get up to speed on commitment devices, which helps you to overcome that Acrasia. Acrasia is sort of like Paul the Apostle, or Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle. Uh, Medea is channeling me once again. My wife made me watch one of those stupid things the other night. <laughs> Can't blame her. It's my own fault. Anyway, Channeling Paul, the apostle, he knows that he shouldn't do things, but he does them anyway. That's acrasia is a procrastination when you should do something. Acrasia is doing something even though you shouldn't do it. Acrasia is when you're looking at the actions over the short term without considering the longer term. So me going to get that catfish, which I probably shouldn't have talked about so much. I'm probably going want to want to go do it is part of that equation, not thinking about the longer term impacts of that. Anyway, I like what he said, that is James Clear, about the commitment devices. Success is less about making good habits easy and more about making bad habits difficult. I'm gonna have to bite the bullet and go back on a diet here sooner or later. <laughs> I don't feel like going on a diet and I like drinking beer. And so a commitment device for me would be just to A, not buy beer or and B, tell my wife, don't buy any beer. Because at the end of the day, if there's no beer in the fridge, there's a better than average chance that I won't drink any beer. I'll just read a book or do something to keep myself busy, maybe have some supper and you know whatever but if there's beer in the fridge it's like ah, well let me just have a beer i worked hard today i deserve that so again success is less about making good habits easy and more about making bad habits difficult so if you hold yourself accountable that's one possible commitment device i mean you could take that to an extreme too if you had a trading partner who was really on your butt. Now, if there's somebody that you're related to or married to, that's probably not the best person for that, but that would be like taken to an extreme example. And I've gave that example before where someone was struggling with their trading is like, well, why don't you share your plan, which your, your trading plan with your wife? And why don't you trade that trading plan and then explain to her what happened afterwards. And also do a little explaining that there's some outcome biases that could happen where Sometimes even good decisions could lead to a bad outcome, but longer term, it's all going to work. And as I've said before, and I know I'm beating a dead horse here, what he said next was kind of shocking. He says, you know what, Dave, that would end the marriage. So he knew that he was making those mistakes and he wasn't ready to commit to 
these commitment devices, such as holding yourself accountable. Now, this is kind of a slight tangent, but this slide was left over from last week, and Sun Tzu sort of rears its ugly head. I, I saw a blog post the other day about middle-aged guys, you know, stop to how to be, stop being a nerd or looking stupid, whatever. It's, one of them was stop quoting Sun Tzu. <laughs> and since then, I'm like, oh, geez, am I quoting Sun Tzu again? But Sun Tzu said, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself and not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Well, one reason I left that in here is because as I'm putting this presentation together, it made me realize that a lot of this presentation really boils down to getting to know yourself. No, I got getting to know you in my head. <laughs> getting to know you. Now, here's the thing. Am I holier than thou? I'm up here pontificating on keeping, not controlling, but keeping your emotions in check and commitment devices and holding yourself accountable and all these little cliches. But am I holier than thou? And the answer to that question is, hell no. I cuss and I fuss. I'm a very emotional Creature, my propensity for profanity caused me or inspired me to soundproof my office that I'm building and stay on top of the contract and make sure that that was done properly. Now, again, I'm very emotional. I cry like a schoolgirl when I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie. And I have a really serious problem with agreeableness. And that's probably the worst trait a trader can be cursed with. And I think it was Larry Williams' son, who is a doctor. I don't know if he's a psychologist, but he wrote a book on trading psychology, which is pretty good, by the way. And I have to dig it out of storage. But I'm pretty sure that's where I, I got the idea from. I took the personality test. I think it's what they call the big four. And I scored, or I guess I should say I didn't score in agreeableness, like I was the worst, <laughs> that was the worst out of all my scores, meaning that I expect everyone to agree with me. And I told my wife and youngest daughter this, and like it was some big revelation, like, wow, I just discovered this thing about me, and maybe that's why I, I get so frustrated in my trades and blah, 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 blah. And they looked at me like I just pooped my pants. <laughs> So it's kind of like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. Everybody knows that. So I am not a very agreeable person. And that is a big flaw when it comes to trading. So without going off on a tangent too much, imagine that, I would encourage you to take a personality test. And one other thing I was thinking about today is this one little presentation. There are so many other things, and I've covered a lot of these things, obviously, under the trading psychology module, and then in trading full circle under the psychology there. And you'll notice some of the slides come from there. But there's so many different tangents we can go off on based on just these neurology things that are hindering us as traders. But again, so rather than present the problem without a solution, let's get back to the solution. So step three, this is the simplest of all. I didn't say easy, but I said simple. You want to slow things down a bit. So before your next decision and the next several million decisions thereafter, and by the way, I forget the exact number, but it's a ridiculous number of decisions that we make every day. It's in the thousands and tens of thousands. Now, the example I often give is you ever snap at your spouse, you ever say something and before it can reach their ears, you want to take it back. You can see their eyes slowly kind of widen, looking back at you. It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> well, the simple thing you can do there is count to three. And that helps you to bypass that amygdala or stop that amygdala from an overreaction to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. 
Now, it's a while back, I was doing a presentation, and my wife's like, what are you going to talk about? I said, well, I'm going to talk about the fact that an amygdala is blah, 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 and if you just wait a few seconds before making a snap reaction to someone, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. And she's like, do you do that? You know, she was like kind of looking at me sideways, and I'm like, baby, you have no idea how often I do that and don't say what I want to say. So I like to see it as that little Terminator brain thing. Remember in Terminator? The janitor walks up and he goes, hey, buddy, what do you got in there? Dead cat or a what? And then, you know, the Terminator goes to this little thing in his head. It's like, yes, no, or what? Please come back later. And then some more <laughs> inappropriate responses, which he, I think he chose the one second from last, which I remember seeing in a the theater. And that was absolutely hilarious. But if you could just have the little Terminator thing come up before making your next decision, especially your next trading decision, your life will get a lot easier. And one thing I was thinking about this morning is I'm sitting there watching a commodity-related stock, one of these ETFs that tracks oil, and it has a small gap open today. And I was thinking about playing an opening gap reversal, and I did that little Terminator brain thing and slowed down a little bit, and it got, and it got me thinking that, you know what, Dave? This is not the mother of all opportunities. Let's just sit back and be patient and wait for, if you're gonna trade an opening gap reversal, wait for something else to have a really good opening gap reversal. That might not happen tomorrow, that might not happen next week, but it's gonna to come to you and it's gonna be well worth it as opposed to putting that little trade on. So again, kind of going off on a tangent, but it's amazing how that slowing of your reactions can really help. And one thing I was thinking about a few minutes ago, because I do, Due to, especially due to my lack of agreeableness and my emotional nature, I do tend to have really fast snap reactions. And I'm thinking that one thing that I might start to do because I can't get to that three second thing quick enough is just possibly take a deep breath before I respond. So even if I'm going to respond and scream back, I'll still need that big breath of air. And that might slow me down. Now, step four, plan the night before. Now, as I often say, Montier and others has often written about the fact that stress is at its highest when information is changing or uncertain. You think about some of the uncertainties in your life right now and how stressed out you are. And I have quite a few of those, as does everyone else that's living and breathing and has a pulse. But if you think about when stress, again, is its highest, it's when information is changing or uncertain. So when is information changing or uncertain? That sounds like the second the opening bell rings. Now, one thing I've talked about before, and again, like I said, there's a lot of things in here where I went off on many different tangents. But there's a, what would you call this? a method where you mentally rehearse and it's been proven that you can actually mind skull and without showing you what little I know about neurology but if you do enough of this mind sculpting sculpting you can actually create pathways with the myelinated myelinated sheaths in your brain that sort of in a way kind of rewire your brain and they've done a lot of what's his name Robertson and I think the name of his book is mind sculpting and I'd recommend you read that book but they've done a lot of studies where let's say an athlete gets injured and the athlete that sits around and plays video games for the next six weeks gets back and he's very out of shape and he has to kind of relearn whatever his skill was whereas the one who does the mental rehearsing who imagines themselves going down that mountain, skiing through the slopes, or whatever the case may be, that person has a much faster recovery. In some cases, it's, it's, it's almost nil. It's a little, but not much, especially compared to someone who doesn't go through this type of mental process. And the mind sculpting would just be like, well, I'm going to enter here. And just kind of imagine that trade triggers, and then you take the trade. And then... You're going to put a stop in here. Well, just imagine yourself placing that stop and then have the initial profit target and then imagine yourself taking that initial profit target. Now, you don't want to go too crazy in automating all this, but 
if you could see yourself placing those orders and actually doing them and make sure you have some sort of reminder or whatever to actually do those things, such as a commitment device or such as an alert. I get quite a few alerts on my phone that reminds me, hey, I need to take a trade that I may have forgotten about. So whatever it takes to make you commit to that trade, go ahead and do that after you do all your mind sculpting. Now, it's cliche, but just do it, okay? Whenever you feel an urge to take some unnecessary action, then just consult with your trading plan and follow along. I know, easier said than done. Now, if you bust the plan, if you take an unnecessary day trade, if you micromanage or a host of other bad behaviors, then shame. One of the guys, his name was Casey at Charlie Kirk's retreat last December in St. Lucia pointed out the fact that he has a confession journal. And I have a little notebook here that I wrote shame on. And when I find myself doing something I shouldn't do, I write it down in that shame journal. And that's one way of holding yourself accountable. And then just writing down my temptations, I find in my trading journal, makes life a lot easier. For instance, getting back to that BYND trade, I wrote in my trading journal that, man, I am tempted to trade this opening gap reversal. I really need to watch myself. And then I think that's part of why I went ahead and threw it out there on the Facebook group and we started discussing it there. And luckily, I'll pull back. By the Facebook group, group I'm talking about Dave Landry's Trend Traders. And if you're a member of DaveLander.com, make sure you join that group. So in summary, don't be a lizard brain. Knowing a little neurology helps to make you feel normal. As long as I've been at this business, you would think I'd be a lot more relaxed and a lot more calm in my execution. You listen to my nightly reports and you're like, man, this guy's really got it all going on. You know, <laughs> he makes it look so easy. Well, the reality is I'm cussing. And I'm fussing, but I'm working to get better. I know I've been saying that for 20 years. But in knowing a little neurology, I really think it helps to make you feel a lot more normal. Now, often I talk about the trading psychology, which sort of dovetails in with a lot of this. The fact that we're not made to trade from a psychological level because we want to control the situation and we have no control over what the other participants may do. We have to sit here. It's killing me to sit here. It's killing me lately because there hasn't been a whole lot of opportunities. But I have to do just that. I have to be patient. So there's a whole other host of psychological behaviors that make it that make us not made to trade. But the bottom line is there's also a little neurology. And, and accepting the psychology, I think, is harder than accepting the neurology because neurology is more of a fact. Psychology seems to be a little bit more of opinion, even though I think the longer you're at this business, the more you can recognize it as a fact, because it is very hard to be patient. And we're not made to trade from a psychological standpoint. Anyway, know some neurology. Obviously, the dead horse I beat here is that all decisions have emotions. So simply be cognizant, embrace them, and then accept them and get to know yourself and the question is do you really know yourself well i thought i knew myself i mean i knew i was a bit of an emotional being i knew i don't like being wrong but i took a personality test and i learned a lot so again get to know yourself and to those of you who are married <laughs> if you don't know yourself ask your spouse they can often give you a very honest answer of who you are and who you aren't now, hold yourself accountable. I know I beat the dead horse here. And one way to do that is commit to commitment devices. Now, one thing I didn't say along the lines of commitment devices is commitment device doesn't have to be that technical. I'll give you a case in point. I think it was day before yesterday, I was watching for an opening gap reversal and something. And if I watched every little tick, I can all but guarantee you that I would jump in early. In fact, I actually found that temptation. But instead of, instead of entering that trade, what I did was I put in a liberal entry, meaning well above the high, 
of the intraday range and I went on a bike ride, okay? So I physically removed myself from the screen. Now I'm gonna get an alert when I get triggered and I did set a couple of alerts just to let me know if it's doing something else and anything else I should take action on. But instead of sitting here dropping F-bombs and watching that stupid screen all day, I went for a bike ride. So it doesn't have to always be that difficult or complex. That commitment device could actually be pretty damn simple. Now, the dead horse cliche, of course, reads its ugly head. Plan your trade and trade your plan. I know. Stick it hearing that, huh? All right. Any questions or thoughts? Everybody stay awake. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do a, just a quick little update on the 10%. TFM system. I've really kind of beat the dead horse on this, but the reason I beat the dead horse is no matter how much I talk about it, I still get a plethora of questions on it. So the system is really quite simple. It's made for the overall market. It's not designed for individual stocks. We went through that in a lot of detail in last week's Q&A. You want to buy when the market is less than 10% away from its 50-week closing high. And the last two-week lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. In other words, you have two weeks of Landry Light. You want to exit. The exit rules are a little bit more stringent. You want to exit when the market is 10% or more away from its 50-week closing high and the close is less than its 50-week moving average. So let me show you that on a chart. So the theory here is that as long as the market is at or near new highs or no more than 10% away new, from new highs, you want to stay long. And I have it illustrated with this little green line in here. So as long as you're above the line and you're at or near new highs, you want to stay long. And the reason is because if you're close to a new high, then there's a chance that you could go to a new high. And if you go to a new high, there's a chance that you could go beyond that new high. So you can see the market started banging out new highs back here. It started banging out or kept banging out, I should say, for a while. Now, when it begins to implode and you get 10% or more away from that high, okay, so you measure this closing high here, down to here, I think, or was it here? It was here, okay, this particular day here. It's like, okay, wait a minute, this market might be in trouble. Maybe I need to get out of the way. Now, I'm not saying sell the form. You might want to have it appraised. But I'll get aside, I'm not saying sell the form. What I am saying is maybe be selective on any new longs, maybe honor your stops on any existing longs, and then possibly, quite possibly, consider a short or two. Now, you'll notice this ribbon I have programmed down here. It stays bullish as long as there's what? One, two weeks of Landry Light, and what? As long as we are less than 10% away from 50 week closing highs. So let's clean this chart up and then let's take a look at a longer term view of that. And we're getting ready to open it up for individual stocks. So if you guys wanna start talking about those now, that'd be great. And then we're gonna to go to the live chart in just one second. So if we take a look at the longer term chart, this is a weekly chart going all the way back to 2000, actually to 1999. The point that I've been trying to make in these presentations for weeks and weeks and weeks is that something simple like this or even a longer term moving average or Landry Light or bow ties or whatever you want to use can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. So you'll notice in most of this leg back here, the market stayed above the green line. The green line is just a visible, a visible, a visual, visual representation of what's going on up here in this area chart. Now notice the bear market, we went below the green line and we stayed there for a long, long time. Doesn't mean that you won't have some whipsaw here and there, but in this particular case, that was the beginning of the 2000 bear market. And notice your little 10% baseline here. Notice that we stayed above that baseline for a long, long time. And notice that the little ribbon down here stayed bearish it went neutral for a little while but not much you got to squint your eyes right there for the most part it stayed bearish and then it was pretty cool the 2002 2003 bottom because we had a bit of that triple bottom action and it took a while notice that this indicator caught up the price okay it will catch up the price over time 
there is some lag by design built in to keep you from chasing your own tail. And again, you can see that we stayed above the green line for a long, 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 long time. By chance, I saw somebody yesterday selling a magical indicator. <laughs> Their magical proprietary indicator. I need to call it green line, red line. And as long as it's green, you want to stay long. If it's red, you want to be short. It's like looking at this, which I'll give you, it looks a heck of a lot like this. So anyway, I don't want to take away from anybody's research, but it sure looks familiar. 2008. Notice this is 2007 right here. Where are we coming into 2008? Right there. Not to be flippant, but in reading all these books that I read, they always come back to the fact that, oh, the 2008 and how people saw the crisis and all this other stuff and how the crisis caught people off guard and all these other things. And to me, all I did, I wasn't smart enough to know to study the economy or the over leverage or whatever. But I was smart enough to say, wait a minute, where are we headed? What are the bow tie moving averages doing? What's the 50 week simple moving average doing? And all of these things said, well, wait a minute, I think this market could be in trouble. So simple things like this. And again, there's your 10% line, or you can see it stayed above that 10% line for a long, long time. And then notice that it stayed below that green line for a long, long time. Now, because we had such a sharp recovery, this was a little late to catch up. I'm not saying trade this system in and of itself, although I think it does have some merit. I think there's other things you can look at, especially during a V-shaped bottom, which is quite common for markets. But the point is that, again, something simple like this can help to keep you on the right side of the market. And this 2000, 12 run to 2015, which is pretty impressive here. You could see we stayed above the green line for that entire period, a couple of little tests, and then we took off again. So it did go bearish right here, and we did have some sell signals back here. And the market didn't drop a lot. It dropped significantly, though. And it dropped enough to where you would not curse yourself for being out of the market. And this is especially true in something like the Rusty, and don't quote me, but I think the Rusty dropped about 18% from the signal. It was almost a bear market as the media defines a bear market at 20%. So anyway, I know I beat the dead horse on all this, but get a lot, a lot of questions on it. So hopefully this week helps. And if not, go in and watch the last several weeks presentations. Now the question is, is winter still coming? And Pastor John Snow has been talking about winter for eight seasons. <laughs> This market lately has been more disappointed than the last episode of Game of Thrones. Well, let's go to live charts and talk about that. Before we do that, if you are a member of DaveLander.com, a gold member, or if you're on the service, which you get the gold free if you are, make sure you join the Facebook group. And it's going to ask for your email when you go to join, and that's just to make sure that you are a member of DaveLander.com. And as soon as I see it, I'll approve you right away. I am very happy and kind of blown away. I've been involved with groups before in forums and it's impossible to get a forum going. It's impossible to keep a group going, but we seem to have gained some momentum. And by the way, you guys may be proud. Somebody asked a money manager question and two of you guys answered with impeccable answers. Save me from having another surgery from all this repetitive <laughs> typing and mousing. Anyway, just let you know that the group is going along very well, and I'm very happy with that. Now, again, I'm helping those who want to be helped. So if you're having some psychology problems, or let's just say you don't know what your problems are, and I come in here and we look at your course progress, and we see that you haven't completed the mindset course, then we know that maybe you need to focus on that first. And I'm proud of some of you guys. Some of you guys have been taking snapshots of your screens and sending them to me, and so it's like, okay, you're getting it. Anyway, my ultimate goal would be to have an answer for every question, but as you know, we do bi-weekly Q&As for those who just make sure we cover anything that might have slipped through the cracks, or I could point to you where the information is. It took me about a year to put all this together, and I'm still building it, so I think you'll be impressed. All right, let's hop out to the live charts. Yeah, Charles said, while I'm waiting on this chart to update, his question is, he says, hey, I missed the previous entry on Yeti. Is it still a short at current levels? 
The answer is yes. In fact, I had it in the Landry list last night as a potential short. And one thing that you could do with that one is you could use deep in the money options as opposed to outright shorting, just in case it's hard to find a short, okay? Okay, so the question is, he missed the Yeti short. Now, if you miss a setup and the setup is no longer set up, then don't take it. So the question is, is this still a setup? Yes, and that's why I put it in a lander list last night. And he said 2650, I would, I would give it a little bit more wiggle room than that. Maybe down around, let's say, 25 or 25 and a half. There's always a trade-off. If you enter too far away, you run the risk of getting the low tick. If you enter too close, you run the risk of getting entered on noise alone. So I'd say 25, 25, 50, be a new reshort on that one. I think the stock is still in trouble. Now, before I forget, uh, keep the stock picks coming. Let's take a look at the overall market real quick, and then we'll, we'll get back to your individual stock picks and questions. First of all, let's start with the P's. As you know, I like to look at the micro and then work out to the macro. On a micro level, we're very overbought, okay? And backing the chart out a little bit, we see that so far, this has just been a big retrace rally up. Kind of looks like what I call the gatekeeper pattern. It just looks like it's still in trouble. Now, if we get past the prior highs in here, then maybe we're okay. But I would like to see it get past those new highs and stay there and not look back for a while. Anything less, I'm going to remain skeptical. Now, one thing I did find interesting is Charlie Kirk had mentioned the Jamie, what's his name? I get confused because there's like three different Jamies I know, and then one's a salt, one's a salt. Uh, anyway, S-A-U-T, I think. I have the link in the Facebook group. But he, he was making the point that a bull market technically doesn't start until the market makes new highs. So we actually started back here in 2000, I guess that's what, let's get a reading on that. 2013 and not 2009. So based on those measurements, and I did a little research, I've got it scribbled down here somewhere. But if you look at the new highs and count that as bull markets, they run 15 years or more. So maybe we have a little bit low, a little bit longer to go based on that metric. And I hope we do. But I'm going to be prudent in the meantime. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ kind of looks like the P's quite a bit so far. Just kind of retracing back up. If we got back to new highs, then I'd say, well, let's not worry so much. But for now, I think we have to remain cautious. I think all of these indices, as I've pointed out recently, have bow tie down, okay? Now that bow tie remains in effect until and unless we take out the old highs, okay? Not that you wanna rush out and do your market timing just on that, but it's a good way of looking at it. So in this particular case, this bow tie here, and I said remains in effect, by that I mean that the top remains in place. So, so far this market has topped, and in order to negate that top, at least on a daily chart, it would have to go on to make new highs. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. You can see it's rolled over shorter term. My big concern here, as I've been saying in nauseam, is that we've got this big old fat thrust down, followed by a retrace, okay? Kind of a, a bigger picture of what's actually happening on a smaller level in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ because it never did get back to its old highs. It's all well short of them. Now, if we get past this little peak in here and we keep going higher, then I might not worry so much. A lot of the sectors look like the market itself. A lot of areas look questionable. There's the energies you can see, they're not looking so hot. Let's take a look at the semiconductors. I've been really bullish. I'm sorry, I hope that Freudian slip slipped maybe. I've been really bearish on the semiconductors. And you can see, if you take a look at the major bigs here, it looks like they're in the early form of being in a lot of trouble. Let's take a look at the socks, which you could actually buy if you want to, or 
if you take a look at the SOXS, you could see now if you want to trade these longer term, but you can see that we did bow tie down from lows and then we've had that deep retracement in here. So I would keep an eye on this just in case we have a big opening gap reversal and look to play that as a possible way to play those semis on the downside. You don't want to hold these too long though. These inverted shares will all go to zero eventually and the tracking errors are also abysmal on them. But for a day trade, they can work out pretty nicely. So as you go through the sectors, it's kind of mixed throughout. You can see a lot of these areas like drugs have sold off, retrace it back up, but still in a downtrend. Let's take a look at the banks. You can see just kind of wide and loose and all over the place. So there's a few areas like defense that's up towards new highs. Eh, not too good. Not as good as I thought it was. I was up at new highs a few days ago. But most areas still looking questionable at best or I like the overall market. A couple exceptions here, retail being one. But then back to the downside, computer hardware looks like it could be in trouble. Software not too far from all-time highs. But most areas still look like they could be in trouble, okay? Design. This one recently pulled back and I liked it a lot. The only problem, as I told everybody in the service, because this was one that I showed for quite a few days, is that longer term, it's kind of wide and loose. It does have some overhead supply. You could have some bad memories on this stock, but shorter term, I liked it quite a bit. And the reason I liked it shorter term was it was accelerating higher and then it pulled back. But now I think I would leave it alone. Okay, it's just too many days since it made the new highs. If it goes on to make new highs and then pulls back again, then maybe, just maybe, it might be worth a shot. All right, Zach wants to know about FICO. Okay, so one thing I see here is that, well, it's not super thick. In other words, it doesn't have a tremendous amount of volume. But if you take the volume and multiply it by the price, it's it's a fairly thick stock, okay? In other words, the market cap's pretty big. You back the chart way out, you can see this thing has had a pretty good run. Now, I know I'm a trend follower, but when a stock like this gets extended like this, I have to ask myself, is it price for perfection? Now, I don't want to use the F word, that's fundamentals for those who don't know, but when a stock gets or becomes high price like this, and if it's in a, if somebody could tell me what they do, it does look like they're splitting the atom, some sort of diversified services, then they are sort of held accountable to the accounting. In other words, the fundamentals, I'm not going to say you can time off of them, but the fundamentals can be sort of judged and it can also be they held hostage or they will be held hostage to them a little bit more because a lot of analysts will will try to figure out where the stock should be and so on and so forth. So the point I'm trying to get to is that a lot of times when they're high like this and extended, they tend to be priced for perfection. The overall markets look a little questionable in here. So this could be a case where the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The other thing too is it's not set up. It would actually have to pull back quite a bit before I would consider it a setup. I like to see people knocked out, traders knocked out through either something like a TKO, an actual trend knockout, or a deep pullback as a general statement. Now, if we're in a rip roaring bull market and we're just having little bull flags along the way, then by all means, these shallow pullbacks can work. But I would be cautious on something like this. And again, it could be the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Sometimes it's a little bit perverse, but sometimes these stocks that have been in long, long-term uptrends up a thousand percent or whatever, let's say the market does begin to take off again. Well, sometimes they could be a source of funds, okay, for institutions to begin to dump. Now, you can't trade off of that, but just make sure, because that's in the back of your head, that you have a really good setup that you really like before you go after it. Okay, Mike says FICO is a people behind the credit scores. Okay, I got you. All right, so they're not they're not really splitting the atom here, okay? And I don't know if the barrier to entry is that easy in this business, but they probably have a lot of competition. They probably can be held to certain numbers. And in other words, it'll probably become more efficient type of market, okay? Uh, let me see if I could pull something up real quick for you, because Zach was asking me about, was it LLL? Zach was asking about TKOs. A TKO should stick out like a sore thumb. So this was sort of a TKO here. 
I actually would have liked to have seen a much bigger knockout type of move. And oh, by the way, the other thing with that FICO is your HV is 27, which is a little bit on the low side. I'd like to see uh, something a little bit more wild and crazy, not maybe as crazy as design, but something with a little bit more volatility to it, okay? If you're trading a stock like FICO with an HV of 27, you're gonna to have to put up a lot of margin in order to capture a small move in that stock. Whereas something like this, you're gonna trade a much smaller size and the volatility is such to where if it does take off, you're not gonna, you, you'll still make a lot of money. And if it doesn't work out, you could stop down without putting a lot of money at risk. And in other words, something bad could always happen in a stodgy company. The CEO could decide to grow up as secretary and or like in case it was Dell years ago when we shorted Dell and it got stopped out right before well, I stopped myself out on purpose because like an idiot, but right before it imploded, they were cooking the books. So bad things can happen even in good companies or companies that you perceive as good. Anyway, back to that LLL. So not that you want to rush out and trade this particular one, especially because it's so low in HV, but your TKO move should be sort of blatant and sort of obvious. It should stand out like a sore thumb. Notice the size of this bar compared to the other bars here. And again, I actually like to see a bigger knockout move. So just because something takes out a two bar low, which is part of the rules, doesn't mean it's a TKO. You want to make sure it has designer's intent. Designer's intent is to help ensure that people were actually knocked out of the market and possible shorts were attracted in, C-O-D-A. So this looks like a one day wonder. I would not buy this stock. It's up 42% today, okay? So there's nothing that fits my methodology here. There's no reason why I'd wanna go after that particular stock because just because it's a one day wonder. You want to have structure and follow through and ideally persistency and acceleration and all those things I preach about before going into a stock. But in this particular case, it's just a one day wonder. I see no reason why you should go after a stock that looks like that. OK, OK. What scans do you use to find setups such as TKOs, pullbacks, et cetera? Let me show you something, Zach. I know you don't have telechart but if you did i would show you where to get it and you could use this for your whatever program you have the bottom line is i like to look at a lot of stocks and i look at a boatload of stocks so it's not like i have any one particular scan and i haven't done so lately it's been a few years since i've worked with hedge funds but back when i worked with hedge funds i used to write or used to well i wrote, I wrote some of them but I used to use a little bit more, what am I trying to say? I used to use a little bit more stringent scans, but the scans that I'm using now, let's see if we can get the, if you go to the members area and then you come down here to member resources. And by the way, you guys give me some feedback. Let me know if the navigation is here. This site has gone through many iterations long before you ever saw it. But, and I think that it's pretty intuitive, but if not, let me know. And right here under these member resources, you have the tracking spreadsheet and then you have the scan. So these are the actual scans that I use. It's a very loose parameter pullback scan. I'm just looking for new highs. And Zach, you have a stock selection course. Go through that first and you'll see how I actually find the stocks. In fact, you'll actually see me in the course go through my tradable universe, go through my scans and then actually pick stocks and then we see how they work or how they don't work and luckily it worked out pretty good if memory serves when we did that stock selection webinar knock on wood or course i should say a little nervous to redo the course because we did so well back then and then the ipo thing same thing i showed you how we did the ipos and they did really well and some of this is down very down in the members area too okay any more individual questions or picks? Anything else? Okay, Uber. Now, Uber, I wrote an article about as another possible turd, <laughs> like some of these other hot IPOs. And I might have to change my mind on that. So what's my litmus test for an IPO? Well, I buy the ones that go up. If they don't go up, I don't buy them. Channeling 
Will Rogers. For me to buy this, though, it would have to be A, above the high that was set on day one, because remember, that's our first rule with IPOs, unless, of course, we're playing a pullback, which we might have now. And we do have a pullback now, okay? So is it set up? Sort of, because it took off and then it pulled back. But for me to get excited about it, I would like to see it make new highs. And I think the point I'm trying to get to here is because this is a big fixed stock because it's well publicized and because it didn't really do that great right out of the gate. What I want to see here is I would like to see it make new highs and stay there and then pull back before getting too excited. I'd like to see what I call a secondary setup, something a little further down the line as opposed to this brand new IPOs. Now, I will trade these primary signals when I have them, but usually that's in lower price stocks. Now, let me just show you one more thing here real quick. I'll show you a pioneer signal. One of the pioneer signals we talked about was A, if you have daylight and B, you have a new closing high. Well, we didn't really get above the new closing high here. So that was not a buy, but it was very close to a buy, okay? So you wanna give them a little wiggle room above that opening day range, okay? Wait at least five days and then low above the moving average. And I never did name this pattern. I need to come up with a name for it. I think we had a few suggestions, okay? So that's where I am on Uber. I'm gonna pass for now. If it makes new highs and pulls back, I might go after it. Technically, yes. It is a little bit of a pullback in here. It might be worth a shot, but for me, I just can't get that excited about it. Do your telechart scans work with the lower levels, gold, silver, only platinum version? Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. The, uh, the TC scans work. See, I had TC back before they even had these gold and platinum levels and everything. Yeah, they'll work with the regular levels. In fact, I was actually using like an offline version when I first got TC, I think. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any more questions? Well, while we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate you taking time to come to the show. Any other questions? You know the routine. Uh, ideally, you want to, if you're in the members area, submit them through the Q&A, and there's a different process for me handling them there. Obviously, you already know about that. Or if you need an immediate answer, if you're in the Facebook group, then put them there, and Dave Landry Trend Traders. And if you're not a member of either of those, then you can submit them through the contact form on the website. And again, I'll either cover them in a Q&A or an upcoming weekend charts. All right, everybody, have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And again, thanks again. Thank you so much.